is Mary Janice Davidson. I'm a New York Times bestselling author. And, oh, sorry, sorry, force of habit. 2021 is weird. 2021 is, is just very, very weird. Uh, as I was saying, um, my name is Mary Janice Davidson. I'm a New York Times bestselling author, and today I am reading a, a short prologue in the first chapter from my time travel historical fiction, A Contemporary Asshat at the Court of Henry VIII. Um, I'm not going to attempt any English accents, so for the purposes of this reading, all of the characters are going to sound like they're from uh, the Midwest. Sorry. Prologue. King Henry VIII is a fat bastard, and no matter what, I'll always hate him. I hate his mean piggy eyes, I hate his sweaty jowls, I hate his smell, his politics, his casual brutality. I have to constantly remind myself that killing him would be bad. No matter that I'd probably never be caught, no matter that it'd be easy and deeply satisfying. And I have to keep thinking that because I'm in his company a lot. He likes me. All this because I get migraines and know the Heimlich maneuver. Chapter one. It's really not that complicated, on my end at least. It goes like this. In the wee hours, I hardly ever get the call at noon. ITCH, Information Technology for Culture and History, reaches out to me to tell me we've got another losty. If I have time, I take a shower. There's no way to predict how long I'll be gone or if I'll have access to niceties like hot running water and shampoo. I grab my gear and hustle my sleepy self to their woefully underfunded, understaffed secret lab. Yeah, they really call it that. Discussions on the intense lameness of this have fallen on deaf ears. Then we all yell at each other for a couple of minutes, me about the sheer madness of their continual tinkering with tech they've proven they don't understand, and them about me wasting time yelling at them about tinkering with tech they don't understand. Then I jump. That's the best and worst part. I don't pretend to understand the tech, and neither do the techs who invented the tech. I don't know why time travel doesn't hurt or why it doesn't play with my brain. I don't know how I can stand on the platform and take one step and find myself in the same general area 500 years earlier as easy and painless as stepping off a sidewalk. And since I don't understand any of that, I focus on what I do understand, finding the losty and bringing them back to the present. And almost every time, finding them isn't even the hardest part. Rescuing them is. All I have to do to find them is follow the gossip or the sermonizing or sometimes the screams. And then voila, there they are, sometimes about to be burned for witchcraft, or tortured for being a witch, or imprisoned for inadvertently breaking the law, tortured and then burned as a witch. The 16th century enjoys Ku Klux Klan levels of intolerance. So the first thing, I have to hit the ground running. Literally running, because I appear out of nowhere, and for half a second you can see the lab and the techs gaping at me through the transfer window. If there are any witnesses to a site that would freak people out in my time, never mind five centuries earlier, I have to get away quickly. Fortunately, the gate tends to dump me beside the same enormous willow tree, and the long fronds do a great job of concealing me until I am ready to be unconcealed. More fortunate, the lab was built on what was historically an underinhabited area, which is a good trick in Great Britain, one of the more consistently settled places on the planet. It's on the bare outskirts of London, and civilization isn't far away. This is good news for me, because it means I usually end up in roughly the same spot. The bad news, the gates the losties fall through, can spit them out anywhere between here and 20 miles from here. So the trick is to get going right away and keep an intent yet distant look on your face, as if you know what you're doing, but you're in a rush and thus a bit preoccupied, no time to stop and chat. So very sorry. Like a party where you don't want to get hit on because you're looking for the guy your friend swears will be perfect for you, focused yet distant. This time the only witness to my abrupt appearance were several ravens perched in the willow tree. This was better than being spotted by people, but only just. Ravens are creepy, creepy birds. Intelligent, predatory meat eaters. Wolverines with wings. I glared at them, hiked up my skirts, and set out at a ground-gobbling trot. In no time at all, I was making use of the 16th century version of Hertz Rent-A-Car. Important tip, uh, in the past as well as the present and probably the future, having money makes everything easier. In this case, the smith was happy to sell me his best horse. 
but I don't want to buy it. It's yours, milady. This with a dramatic flourish, since he was a foot taller than me with the build of a linebacker, grimy from head to toe and brandishing a hammer. This could have been terrifying. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I am not buying the horse. I will bring it back. I promise. He made a show of listening. My Midwestern American accent befuddles people in modern London and in the 21st century. And then shrugged and proved he wasn't listening. I have other horses, he assured me, pocketing the gold. When you return, you may buy any you wish. Yeah, but I'm not. Thank you. How many times was I going to have this discussion before I wised up? It was tricky enough getting me and a losty through the gate. I didn't want to think of the logistics of hauling back a horse. But as annoying as this recurring argument was, it could have been a lot worse. As usual, my clothes had done most of the talking for me. As for my accent, people who didn't sound like everyone else were not unheard of in 16th century London. Rule number one, dress like you're somebody. Not royalty, that was a test I would flunk. But nobility, I could pull that off with the right clothing and because Henry VIII liked me. Discomforting as it was to be in the good graces of a narcissistic sociopath, it gave me the confidence to pull off the attitude I needed to stay unburned. Even if during trips like this one, I never actually crossed paths with his royal grossness. So my deep blue gown looked like it was pulled together by a skilled tailor, hugging my figure until just past the waist and dropping to the ground in a series of folds that looked artfully crumpled. This was a cut considered old fashioned, hilarious given where I was. My wide detachable sleeves were turned back to show a lighter blue silk lining, silk as uppity a cloth as I dared wear. Only royalty and high nobility were allowed to wear it. And draped so low and cut so full, I could have had a boulder strapped to each arm and no one would notice. I had a chain around my neck that looked like gold and my low slung belt was good for more than decoration. I had attached a pomander to it via another gold chain. My hair, a color exotically known as brown, had finally grown out enough to be pulled back and stuffed under my black velvet headdress. If my clothes had been truly authentic, I would have needed at least two maids to help me get in and out of them and another one to tackle my hair. If I were authentic, I wouldn't be wearing my notorious RBG underpants. I wouldn't have any underwear at all. If you were a woman in this day and age and you had to pee and you didn't want multiple maids crowding into the privy to help you, you lifted your skirts and went. No underpants. Gross, yet practical. And before you suggest that getting caught with 21st century panties could get me in untold amounts of trouble, if whomever caught me knew what kind of underwear I had on, I was already in a lot of trouble. Besides, my underwear is nobody's business, I said before I remembered that was an exceptionally dumb thing to say out loud. Fortunately, my accent foiled the smith, who just blinked and said, uh, If I could ask, my lady, why are you traveling alone? I was ready for that one. I'm not. My husband is just up the road. Take every care. His mild curiosity satisfied, he tipped me a casual salute and in next to no time was boosting me into the saddle on a pretty roan mare with a back like a dining room table. Oh, sore thighs tonight, guaranteed. I had been surprised to find that riding a horse is not work just for the horse. Your arms, hands, legs, back, they're all in play. It's not like the movies where everyone just effortlessly rides for hours while having a good time. At worst, once they climb down, they, they stretch a bit and then they're back in business. Nuh-uh. Being in the saddle for any length of time is exhausting. Pretty soon I'd be able to crack golf balls with my thighs. But short of renting a carriage complete with a team and driver, my options were limited. My kingdom for a moped. I got lucky again. My losty had stumbled across one of the few people from this time who wouldn't be horrified by someone popping out of nowhere, dressed in never seen anything like a clothing, and talking crazy. Thomas Winter. I hadn't been riding two minutes before he loped. He was a, a human-shaped gazelle. 85% of him was legs. Out of the gray horse in and waved me over. I grinned at him. I couldn't help it. It was always nice to see Thomas Winter, and not just because I like not just because I like redheads with great forearms. And here you are again, and as lovely as ever, if you'll allow me, Lady Joan. As always, you seem not to age a single day. I had aged weeks, actually, but Thomas thought we'd known each other for years, ever since the field of the cloth of gold fifteen years ago. You need a husband, he reminded me. It was a recurring theme. The smith would have been shocked, shocked to learn I had lied, was in fact single and ready to mingle. You spend far too much time on your own unless you're shepherding one of your lambs. Lambs, yeah. <laughs> Bewildered, hair trigger, hair trigger feral cats was a little closer to the truth. You're the one lying in wait for me outside taverns, I teased. You need a wife. Aye, I, I do. 
so you loitered to wait for me? I, he admitted cheerfully. You're drawn to people like this, no need to deny it. Once I saw this poor lass, I knew you'd be along directly. Poor lass was accurate. She'd crept out of the inn a few feet behind him, swathed head to toe in a heavy dark wool blanket. That likely elicited comment, as it was August, but not as much comment as her, as her clothes would have. Shorts, probably. Her legs were bare. Maybe a t-shirt and flip-flops. She blinked up at me with light brown eyes, squinted a little against the summer sunshine, and rubbed her earlobe, which was bloody and torn where someone had yanked her earring. She had dirt on her forehead, and her hair was a messy blonde cloud. Her hands were fisted in the blanket, holding it tightly around her like a fuzzy shield. I am having the weirdest. It's all right. I'm here to take you home. She was already shaking her head. You don't understand. I'm not supposed to be here. I have to wake up. <clears throat> Amazon, tablets, iPhones. Oh, thank God. Yeah, that always did the trick. And Thomas, bless his gingery heart, thought it was part of my charm. Your strange words soothe them as when the monks chant, he observed. Yeah, exactly like that. Thomas, uh, give her a boost, would you? Of course, my lady. And he did, lifting my losty almost as easily as the blacksmith had tossed me. Thomas was in excellent shape for a man who self-identified as a scholar and spent most of his time reading. In addition to those nice long legs, he had agreeably broad shoulders, if you were into that, and his hair was a deep, rich auburn, so dark in some lights it was the color of grenadine and coke. Oh, cherry coke. His bright blue gaze never left my face. I blinked and decided it was time to get back to business. I'll take her to the doctor. Or a priest, Thomas suggested. Uh, yeah, a priest, that'll fix her right up. Uh, you're going to get a reputation, Thomas. Soon everyone will think you only come to stay at the inn to catch strays. You are the only stray I wish to, wish to catch, he declared. Aw, sweet. Probably, I don't know. <clears throat> it was nice seeing you again. I quite agree. Dare I ask if once you've tended to your charge, you might... I, I, Thomas, I apologize. I, I can't. Next time, I lied. Again. He quirked half a smile at me. No need to tease, my lady. If you keep to your pattern, I won't see you again for months, perhaps years. It bothered me to turn him down, partly because he was always helpful, and I owed him a lot more than a tankard of ale. Plus, he was gorgeous, single, liked me, probably didn't think I was a witch, watched for me, and thought my essential weirdness was charming. The irony, I couldn't get a second date in the 21st century, but I was catnip in Tudor time. But it was safer for both of us to turn him down. Nothing could ever come of it, and every minute I was here, I was exposed. Lingering for the 16th century equivalent of a tall double foam wasn't just indulgent, it was dangerous. I'm sorry, I began, but... Steel fingers seized me by the upper arm. <laughs> oh, will you shut the fucking chit chat? Get me the fuck out of here. The last he had hissed this into my ear so rapidly, all I heard was, you shut the fucking chit chat out of here, which was my cue. <clears throat> Goodbye. Thomas swept me a grateful, a graceful bow. Farewell, Lady Joan. I didn't look back as we trotted back to the smith. I never do. End chapter one. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, a, a contemporary asset at the court of Henry VIII is available on audio as a paperback and on Kindle on Amazon. And if you are a member of Kindle Prime, you can get it for free. Thank you so much for your attention.